Hi boys and girls. I'm so glad to have a chance to spend some time with you today. And I wanted to talk to you about our story about Paul. We've been talking about him. So we're going to continue talking about the Apostle, and that's Apostle with a capital A, Paul. Now, do you remember why Paul could claim that he was an Apostle with a capital A? Think about it. We talked about it. That's right. He is an apostle with a capital A because he actually talked with Christ, the risen Christ, when he was on the road to Damascus. And Christ appeared to him. And so he can claim that he is an apostle with a capital A. And Jesus told him to go and teach the Gentiles. Now, what's a Gentile? We haven't really talked about that, so let's talk about that for just a minute. The definition of a Gentile, according to the dictionary, is someone who isn't Jewish. So if you think about it, Jesus was Jewish. The original 12 apostles were Jewish. Paul was Jewish. So somebody who wasn't Jewish was considered to be different. They were an outsider. The Jewish people were very tight-knit. They were a close-knit group and they held together closely. And they didn't like anybody else being a part of their group. So here's Paul. He's gone through this huge experience that completely changed his life from someone who hated the Christians, who didn't want people to become Christians, didn't want people to follow Christ, to someone who is now, on the other hand, encouraging people to follow Christ, to become believers. That's just amazing. Just amazing. People had a hard time understanding that Paul really had made this big change in his life. He declares that we are saved by God's grace. And that means that God gave him and gives us his favor instead of the punishment that we deserve and that Paul deserved as a sinner. God was powerfully working on the mind and heart of Paul to change his life. And that's what happens to us when we become Christians. Our life is changed. Now, one of the good things about Paul was that he was trained in the Old Testament. He studied the Old Testament. He knew it backwards and forwards. And God was going to use this knowledge so that Paul could teach the people that Jesus bridged the gap from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And that he is the one who fulfilled all of the prophecies in the Old Testament. So... Paul was God's instrument. Now, this is not an instrument like a piano or a flute or a violin or a clarinet, but it was an instrument where the good news came through Paul to others. Just like the music comes out of an instrument, the good news came out of Paul. God revealed Christ to Paul when he had that experience on the road to Damascus. And God wanted to use Paul then to reveal Christ to others. Now Paul knew that God loved him in spite of the horrible things that he had done to Christians, in spite of the change that he had made, in spite of the fact that he was preaching and teaching about Jesus. Paul knew that God loved him just because God wanted to love him. There was nothing Paul could do to earn God's love. And there's nothing that we can do to earn, to work towards getting God's love. We just have to accept him as our Savior. Now Paul was fearless and confident in his preaching because to him, there, th this change in his life was grounded and founded in the fact that he actually talked to Jesus. So he knows that, that there's nothing else 
that we can do to add to or change the gospel. There's no one that can add to it because the gospel always stands. Nothing added to it, nothing changed. So, all of this because Paul wanted to share his testimony with the Galatians. He wanted to help them understand why he had changed, how he had changed, and that what he was telling them came directly from our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. He wanted them to understand that he had authority to tell them the things that he told them. And then let's look at Ephesians 2 for something that I really think is a great message to us. For we are his workmanship, meaning we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, yes, this says do good works, but that means after we are saved, because of the fact that we are saved, we do good works, not in order to be saved. That's a big difference there. But we are his workmanship. We are created by him. And when you think about workmanship, sometimes you think about artwork because painters and, and people who create art have to work towards creating art. So if you think about it, we are God's artwork. He created us. He painted our picture, and we are His. All right, so let's think about these people who are these false prophets. Now hold this up real close. Is this real money? Can I go to the grocery store and pay for my groceries with it? Well, I certainly hope that at home you're saying, no, 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 no. But how do you know that this isn't real money? How, I mean, how do you know? If you had never seen real money, would you know that this isn't real? Now, there are people who work in the banks, and they study. They're trained. They know what money looks like. They know all the details about the money. And here's a big word, big word alert coming. They know when money is counterfeit. When it's not real, this money is counterfeit. It's not even green on the back. So I could not take this to the bank and pay for my savings account, my checking account, or take it to the grocery store and pay for my groceries. I couldn't do it because it's not real. So first these people have to study and they learn and learn about money. They look at it over and over again and they know every detail about it. Second, they memorize all the facts about the different things on the money to look for to make sure it's real. So Paul wanted the people in Galatia to know the gospel and to know that it never changes, that there's nothing we can add to it. And see, that's what the false prophets were trying to tell the people, that there were other things you needed to do in order to be saved. The message from the false prophets was counterfeit. It was not true. It was not something that was good. We need to receive salvation by grace, by faith in Jesus, and that's it. Nothing more. Now the false prophets were causing all sorts of problems in the church in Galatia. There were two groups forming. There were the groups that believed in Paul's guidance, and they believed what he was teaching them. That the gospel stands alone and there's nothing you can add to it. And then there was a second group that was questioning Paul's authority. Is, was he really the one that he said he was? And was he really had a leg to stand on to tell them what he was telling them? And maybe they really should follow these false prophets called Judaizers. Well, now this is kind of like the game Red Rover, Red Rover. Do you know about this game? We played it a lot when I was in vacation Bible school when I was a little girl. Now, in this game, the children divide into two teams. The teams form two lines facing each other. The first group, just like this group up here, holds hands tightly and they call for a player on the other team to run over and try to break 
the line. If they're successful, the player picks one person and brings that person back to their team. If they don't break the line, they have to stay with that team. Now this says Red Rover, Red Rover, send Sally right over. And this is Sally. How do you think Sally feels when she hears her name called to come over? Is she afraid? Is she worried she won't be able to break through the line? Is she confident that she can break through that line and bring someone back to her team with her? Well, it's really hard to know from this picture, but I remember when I heard my name called. I wanted to help my team, and I wanted to make sure that I could bring someone back to my team, so I ran as fast as I could to break through the line. Now, that's how the people in Galatia were feeling. They were holding hands tightly, and one group was not having any luck with the other group and they weren't breaking through and they weren't crossing over and bringing people back to their teams. So the ones that were believing in what Paul taught them rejected the false prophets and rejected the people who were believing the false prophets. And of course, the people who believed the false prophets were angry at the people who believed Paul. So the people argued, they forgot to take care of each other. They were angry with each other. This is not a good thing. God wants us to have a spirit where the two groups come together and unite. He wants us to praise him together. He wants us to tell others about him. He wants us to praise him when we worship with one heart and one mouth. We, as a bunch of believers, love him the same as our Lord and Savior, and we confess the same things about him with our mouths. We've got to keep our eyes on the fact that Jesus is our Savior, and he is the reason that we are a Christian. He died on the cross for us, and the believers in the church need to work together as a unit, as one. And when we have people that believe different things and they can't get along and they can't talk about it, that's not good for our church. So, next week, let's talk more about the need for unity in our church family. And until then, I'm so glad I got a chance to see you today.